So this is the Bio One lab room. Uh, just to point out a few things, um, we do want to wipe things down when we come in. So there will be two of you per lab bench, and you're seated catty corner from one another. Um, and one of you will be running the computer. So when you're done today, wipe off those keyboards again. Um, there are san hand sanitizers here, and there's they're, they're kind of mobile. There's another one back there. There there might be another one back there somewhere. We have some hand sanitizer, so feel free. And if you want, you can also, you know, you could also wear gloves during the lab. We have gloves back here, and we have gloves back there. Uh, if you feel more comfortable doing that, there are some labs where we have to wear gloves. But if you feel more comfortable during the age of COVID and gloves all the time, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, same thing with goggles. Uh, you, we will wear goggles sometimes in class, but you don't have to wear them every day. But if you feel more comfortable wearing them every day, that's your choice, uh, and that's fine. So we have a fire extinguisher right over there in case something catches on fire. Uh, hold pin, aim, and squeeze. Hopefully be one of us doing that. Uh, uh, you might not have to, but if I'm on fire, please put me out. Uh, I wash station here. This handles the trigger, it'll squirt water out and rinse out your eyeballs. There's another one over here. There's an eye wash station right over here, as well as a chemical shower. But notice what's not on the floor under the chemical shower, a drain. So we don't want to play with that because there's not a drain there, so it floods the room a little bit. If you get chemicals on yourself, not that we use anything too scary in here, but if you would get chemicals on yourself, you rinse it off. You don't worry about there no, being no drain. but but don't pull the handle for fun. Uh, they don't want, if, if you were covered in like cyanide, let's say, I don't know why the heck you'd have cyanide in here, but, and you rinsed yourself off and it went in the drain, it would end up in the city drain system and they don't want that to happen. So there's no drain under the chemical showers. So chemical showers are there. Uh, there's a first aid kit in the prep room, which is the room through that door uh, by the window in case we need a Band-Aid or something. So if you ever do have any kind of injury, please report it at once. So we just need to know about it uh, for our own purpose, you know, so we know and, and so we can make sure you're all right. And then if we need to, we can take you to the Student Health Center or whatever uh, if we need to, to follow up on that. But let us know. Um, I do have emergency numbers posted in this window over here for the bio office and UCAPD uh, in case you know, TA should know that as well. They're, they are they are stuck right there, so you know where, who to call in case of, of issues um, uh, right there in the window. Now, we are in the Conway Corporation Center for Science, and we are down here on this end of the hallway. So if there's an emergency, we'll just go down this hallway, out the building. Like I, what I mean by emergency, like there's a tornado. Uh, not tornado. That would be silly to go outside. Uh, if there was a fire, right? Uh, we would we would go down these stairs around Lewis Science Center and meet out here uh, in the grass between Lewis and the Ferris Center. Uh, so that would be fire drill scenario, right? In case of tornado, we all go to the basement of Lewis Science Center. Probably won't be able to socially distance, but it is an old Cold War bomb shelter. It's it's pretty thick concrete down there. We we be we be good to go in the basement of Lewis. So that's where we go in case of a tornado. I mean, not tornado, but Lewis for tornado, outside for fire, right? We are clear on that. We're not going to all run outside in case of tornado. Okay. Now, just so you know, this building is, uh, with this semester, it's kind of different. Uh, what they're hoping to have happen is the entrance to this building is outside, out front, right down here by the street. And then the hallway, you can go left or right. Uh, but then this way is a one-way direction, this way is one way, and then the stairwell that comes up is down here. And so that's how they want that first floor to work. And the second floor where we are, it's supposed to be a one-way hallway going that direction, so one-way travel so people aren't passing in the hall. Um, so keep that in mind uh, when you're navigating around. That's supposed to be the, the directionality of travel is that way. So when you leave here, you go that way, and you can go down the stairs, or you can catch the elevator. Lewis Science Center is also a maze from hell, uh, with arrows pointing in all kinds of directions, and I'm not even going to try to teach you what you're supposed to do in Lewis Science Center, other than to say this hallway is supposed to be 
uh, one direction and this big hallway on the other side of the building is in uh, the opposite direction with hallways uh, intersecting them running various directions. So those are just some of the weird things to think about. We're supposed to wear these things, you know, no food or drink in the lab, all that kind of stuff. And so I do want to point out before I jump into lab, um, if you do have your manual handy, one good place to go uh, for right now is the uh, syllabus. I call it a lab syllabus anyway. Um, on page 69. So you want to be here on time. No food to drink in the lab, etc. There's lots of rules there, but what I really want to go at, get at right now, is the lab safety stuff on page 70. So to be good to go for lab, you want to read the lab before coming to class. Listen to the pre-lab. That's the thing we do at the beginning of class, and the safety instructions from your instructor. Be on time for that. You could miss out if we do take quizzes in person, which we might in a future lab. Um, if you're if you're too late, you won't. If you're more than uh, you know five ten minutes late, you're not going to be able to take that quiz. So you want to be here on time. Know where the fire extinguishers are, etc. We just talked about that. We cannot eat or drink in here. Um, so if you you know my su suggestion would be if you have a bottle of water or something, keep it zipped up in your bag. And if you need a drink, unzip it, take it, step out in the hall, take a drink, and then come back in. Some past semesters, I would leave water bottles in the hallway and you just go out and take a drink, but that's probably not a good idea this semester either. So keep it zipped up, unzip it, take it out, take a drink, bring it back in, zip it back up. Okay. Um, so keep your hands sanitized, keep your bench sanitized, all of that. Uh, wear protective goggles and gloves when around anything dangerous. Um, not too many labs where we have to worry about that and today is not one of the ones where we have to where we have to dress that way dress appropriately for lab what do I mean by that uh, we really ought to have no bare midriffs in here uh, so you don't want your bare belly against a table that might have had chemicals on it uh, and especially uh, also no open toed shoes so we, we shouldn't be wearing foot flops or sandals in the lab okay uh, that's an important one because labs almost always have little bits of broken glass and things or chemicals on the floor and you don't want to get that on your feet. So that's really important when I sometimes have to send students home to go change before we can let them into the lab. Know the instructor, notify the instructor of any spillage, breakage, or injury. Clean up the bench before you go and dispose of things in their proper location. So for example, we have a glass disposal box back there. Glass doesn't go in the trash, it goes in the glass disposal box if you break something. Uh, and also, uh, let's see, I, I have to see if we have a sharps container. Yeah, there's a sharps container back there. So that would be like a razor blade or something that needed to be thrown away would go in the sharps container. Anyway, so that's just some of the basic safety stuff I just wanted to cover before we move on. Any questions about that? Just the basic stuff. I don't think there's anything too hard there, but all right. So the first series of labs here, lab, the first lab in the manual, lab one, is about how to graph and stuff like that, which is what you'll do online next week. Okay, um, that's what the B people are doing today or this week. Um, and then there's this lab, which is lab two in the manual. And lab two and three are part of a series in the manual. It's all about cell membranes. So this is like the preliminary one. And then the second one would pick up where that one left off. So you'll do that one online in a couple weeks. It's a crazy semester. So we'll get to that one soon. But they're over cell membranes. Does anyone know what a cell membrane is? Does it ring any bells? Ooh, impressive. A phospholipid bilayer. So phospholipids, actually I brought my own marker today. Phospholipids, I always draw them like this. They, they have a, a phosphate head and then they have these fatty acid tails. So this part is hydrophilic, it likes water. It reacts, it, it interfaces with water. These tails are hydrophobic and they are repelled by water. And like you said, it's a bilayer. So they, they interface like this. 
And so you have this all the way around the cell. You have this, this phospholipid bilayer, but also stuck into it are various proteins and things that may have different jobs. So that's that phospholipid bilayer you mentioned. By the way, I'm doing most of the pre-lab today, uh, even stuff I had on the online video. In future weeks, I might assume you've watched the video and pick up with what we're doing today, like how the equipment works, so we don't have to you don't have to hear it twice, but for this first one, as we're gearing up, I'll just do most of the whole thing, all right? So phospholipid bilayer. So in a cell, like a plant cell, there's a plasma membrane or cell membrane found here. That's, that's a phospholipid bilayer. Your cells are surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. Then inside, we have uh, all these organelles that are mostly composed of phospholipid bilayers, too. They're all membrane-based. And... Um, this week we're going to focus on the plasma membrane and this membrane here, which is known as the tonoplast. The tonoplast is the membrane that surrounds the central vacuole of plant cells. Central vacuoles are like a big water balloon inside of a plant that store water. And the model organism we're using this week, does anyone remember, anyone have any idea what organism we're really manipulating this week? You want to read that far ahead or get that out of the manual? Beets. Yeah, why in the heck would we want to look at a beet, right? Uh, beet cells. Well, beets are plant cells that in their central vacuole, they contain beta cyanin. Beta cyanin is that red stuff that leaks all over the place when you cut into a beet. And if we're interested in cell membranes, and especially cell membrane damage, um, beets are a good organism to, to use to study that because when you damage their cell membranes, red stuff leaks out. You can see when they've been damaged. If you take some human cells and you damage them, you can't tell very easily if they've been damaged because you have to zoom way in with a scope and look for like membrane damage or something. Well, here, if red stuff leaks out, it means we've damaged this membrane and this membrane. And so we can we can measure it. We can see how red the solution gets around those beet cells, okay? And we can use that to, as a determination of how much damage has occurred. And so uh, we're gonna use beets as our model organism for that reason. Not because we really care about beets in particular, but because they have a cell membrane just like ours. And by the way, cell walls, that plant cells have, that, don't confuse that for the membrane. Walls are like, made of cellulose like this desk and cell membranes are like Crisco they're like oil they're they're very flexible and thin okay so membranes and walls are different things so what we would do in the next lab that, that comes after this one if we were doing this in a normal semester is we would test how alcohol damages cell membranes which actually is pretty pertinent because guess what What is hand sanitizer made out of? Alcohol. Alcohol. And why does it nuke a, a bacterium or virus? Because it pops their membranes. So we, we, you know, it ties into why hand sanitizer works. Um, so that's that's the, the series of labs that this one, the, the first part of. So in order to pull this off, we're going to have a couple of major goals today. Um, these goals are, are listed in your manual um, at the bottom of the first page of each lab in case you ever want to know what the major goals of the day are. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and flip back to today's lab so I can reference the manual to you starting on page 13. So some of the major goals, these may not match precisely uh, with the ones in the manual, but the, some of the major goals today are going to be uh, pipetting, how to use the pipettes in lab. There's, there's a, a pipette for each, a, a, a blue and a, a green one for each uh, set of partners there, so you don't have to share. We're going to use the mass balance equation to make some sol various solutions. We are going to use a spectrophotometer to record absorbance of various solutions of beta cyanin. Remember, beta cyanin is that red stuff that leaks out of a beet cell. 
And we're going to create a standard curve today showing the relationship of, of light absorbance at lambda max. I'll explain this terminology if you don't know what it means yet. Um, and beta sine and concentration. So these are the major goals. So let's walk through some of this to get an idea of what we're talking about. So remember, beta sine is that pinkish purple stuff stored inside the central vacuole of a beat cell. And these are some pictures of some beta sine and uh, also a, a cartoonish drawing of the same thing. So if we damage the membranes of that cell, we should be able to get some, uh, some cell membrane leakage, and then we should be able to record how much red stuff leaks out using the spectrophotometers, which are these boxes that everyone go out there. Now, um, spectrophotometers, the equipment we're using today, utilizes visible light. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, going from radio waves here to gamma rays. And within the visible light spectrum, we go from red light to, well, violet light, purple light, you know, way up here, which my video is kind of covering up. But what I want to show you is that Red light has uh, a wavelength of 750 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Um, that means that light, well, light travels in waves, and from one wave to the next is 750 nanometers in red light. As you move up to, to uh, purple light, the wavelength gets smaller. They're closer together. So there's more energy here in this light than in this light down here. And um, another thing I want to show you is that the symbol for wavelength, the, the symbol is the Greek letter lambda, which looks to me like a, uh, a Y that fell on its head, right? So lambda or that Y looking shape that's upside down, that's the, the symbol for wavelength. Okay, so spectrophotometers, the equipment that we have today, utilize visible light. They will basically, let me show you how this would work. <clears throat> you would take your beet juice and you would have it in a cuvette, which is the fancy word. Cuvette is the fancy term for the containers that you that, that fit into the spectrophotometer. And you have a bunch of cuvettes that look like this. They're inside of these containers at your lab bench. I'll show them off to the camera. Hello. All right. All right. Those are the cuvettes. You would put your, your beet juice solution in there, and you would shine different wavelengths of light through it. And there's a detector on the other side. And that detector picks up what color lights pass through and which ones don't. Now, what's interesting is the way this thing works is it will tell you which wavelength of light, or which wavelength of light is most absorbed by the beet, by the beet juice. What color light do you you think would be most absorbed by beet juice. There's some sitting in the back of the room right there. You can see it in those containers. See what it looks like. So if you shine, sh shined or shown, I don't know the proper past tense, is it? you shine white light through that flask, which wavelengths of light would be absorbed? Which ones would bounce off? Any, 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 any guesses? I'm okay with swags. Let me just give you a term that I like to use, swag. It means scientific wild ass guess. So that's when it's like, well, I don't know, let's just try this. Um, any, any swags? What, what color of light would be absorbed? Purple. Purple? Okay. That's usually what I hear is purple or red. But how does that work? The, we're seeing, what color does it look when we look at it? What does it look like? What color? Really kind of like a purple, right? Well, that means that that purple light is actually bouncing off of it to your eyeball, right? So purple is actually passing through or bouncing off. So, so that's what's interesting is it's hard to tell unless you know how it works, what color is being absorbed. Because we're seeing what's reflected. Like on a whiteboard, what colors are being reflected off a whiteboard? What colors are in white light? All of them, right? 
Uh, what about a, a dark chalkboard? Like, or what about this black tabletop? This is absorbing almost all the wavelengths of light. So, so we have to remember how our vision works. We're picking up whatever's reflected off of that object, but what we're actually measuring today is what's absorbed by the object. So that's a little different way of thinking about things. So I told you that there was a, that, that symbol, lambda, the upside down Y looking thing. So there's this term that you'll see in your book. Uh, my, my lambda always looks like hell. So actually, I, I drew it the wrong way. I drew a Y. See, it really looks like hell. All right, here we go. So lambda max is a term you'll see in your, in your book. Lambda max is what we're going for today. That's the number we're looking for today. This is the wavelength most absorbed. by a substance. So different substances will absorb light at a different wavelength the most. Okay, So they'll absorb light at different places depending on the substance. And why does that matter? Well, what's really cool is you can take a spectrophotometer and let's say you're a forensic scientist and you have a poisoned, poisoning victim. If you know lambda max for cyanide, you can examine their blood or their stomach contents with a spectrophotometer and tell if they've been poisoned with cyanide, perhaps, and how much cyanide was there based on how light is absorbed by those contents. Okay, so using a spectrophotometer, you can you can uh, do interesting things based on this idea that substances absorb light differently. And so, just to give you an idea of how this works, this is actually a screenshot from uh, a lab like this one. Um, let's say you have really co concentrated beta cyanin. It will absorb, so, so I think you can see where light is most absorbed by this substance. It's in the green spectrum, right? This area here, uh, usually for beta cyanin, this one's a little lower than normal, but normally for beta cyanin, we're talking about 535 nanometers is what lambda max typically is for beta cyanin. We'll, we'll double check that in a little bit, but normally, we're going to be looking at about 535 nanometers, and that will be uh, lambda, no, nope, not upside down. That'll be uh, uh, lambda max for beta cyanide. That'll be the wavelength where light is most absorbed. So right here we see which wavelengths are, are, are being absorbed, and over here we see how much light is being absorbed. So in a really concentrated solution, you absorb a lot of light. But as you dilute it down, notice, are these, if you dilute down the, 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 uh, the beta cyanin, is that graph shifting left and right, or is it just going up and down? What's it look like? Going up and down. It's going up, it's, yeah, it's like nested. So lambda max, the, the wavelength most absorbed, does not change. Uh, the wavelength doesn't change. So it's always green, right? It's just how much light it absorbs changes if you have a concentrated or a dilute solution, okay? So, so students all have a quiz and it'll be like, if like here, here, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a, an example quiz question. If lambda max for a 10 molar beta cyanin solution was 535 nanometers, so that's for a 10 molar, so I'm just going to say 10 molar solution, okay, is 535. What would it be for a 20 molar solution? What would lambda max be? I know it's hard, harder, a uh, harder audio question than to read it, but if for 10 molar, lambda max is 535, what would lambda max be for a 20 molar solution? It's still 535, there you go, see? It's, 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 it's the same. Absor how much light it absorbs might be different or would be different, but the graph doesn't shift left or right. It goes up and down, right? Something to keep in mind. Now, in order to, uh, let me kind of give you the, the point of today's lab then. The point of today's lab 
is to make a standard curve. A standard curve is, um, and I'll define it more later, but a standard curve is a graph. So let's say you have a graph where you have um, beta cyanin concentration. I'm not going to put units on this graph right now. And you have absorbance of light here, okay? And you test different concentrations of beta cyanin to see how much light they absorb. You know the concentrations of beta cyanin you're testing, and you can look at how much light they absorb, and you can make a graph of that. And you can put a best fit line on that graph and all that good stuff. Okay, so what if like in two weeks you had another lab where you were looking at cell membrane damage? And let's just say this goes from 0 to 16. I'll, I'll go ahead and put units on it. Micromolar. 0 to 16 micromolar, let's say, is what your what your graph has on that axis. What if in what if in a week we 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 did an experiment looking at cell membrane damage and alcohol on beets? So you put some alcohol on a piece of beet and it leaks out red stuff and you put it in the spectrophotometer and let's say absorbance here is like 0 to 10 okay what if the the piece of beet next week leaked out or, or when you looked at absorbance it had an absorbance of 8 let's say the unknown the one from next week had an absorbance of 8 could you figure out the concentration of beta cyan in that what do you do you go from where it started up there and go to where it connects to the line. And to the best fit line and then down, right? Or you can use the equation of the line and solve it mathematically for a slightly more accurate answer. Um, so you can use then this, this, this standard curve. Standard means the standards are the known concentrations that you worked on this week. That's what a standard is. So you have standard curve that you've done, and then you can figure out the concentration of unknown stuff using that standard curve in, a, in another experiment. Now, in order to do that, we're going to have to make dilutions of beta cyanin of different concentrations, because we have one concentration back there in two different jars. And that concentration for today is 16 micromolar. Molar being a concentrate, if you haven't had chemistry yet, mol molarity, molar, that's a... Uh, um, a unit of concentration basically, right? So um, micromolar, um, the micro sign means a millionth. So uh, a millionth of a molar. So we have a beta cyanide solution, uh, a stock solution in the back of the room of 16 micromolar concentration. So we're going to have to then dilute that to different concentrations and see how much light it absorbs. That way in the future we can solve questions with unknown concentrations of beta cyanide using our graph that we'll make today. Now, the mass balance equation. Anyone read over this, get a little nervous on the, on the manual, or, or you all think you got it, or how are you feeling about it so far? Mayor? The formula is C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2. C1 stands for the concentration of the stock solution that you're giving. V1 stands for how much of it you need to make a dilution. C2 is the concentration of what you're trying to make. And V2 is the volume, how much you're trying to make. Okay? So concentration is how much of it there is in there, right? And, and V is volume. That's how much of it you need. So let me just write that right down up here. C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2. So what if, I'm trying to remember Dr. Puri's example. She said, what if you have 100%, this is C1, 100% Gatorade, it's just a bottle of Gatorade, but you want to make it a little more hydrating. You want to, you want to just make it 50% Gatorade. Okay, so C1 times V1, we don't know what V1 is, so I'm just going to put X. So this times X equals, let's say concentration 2, what did I say it was going to be 
50%. And let's say we want to make, uh, oh, let's just make it easy. We're going to make one liter of it, one liter. So we have 100% Gatorade. I'm just going to put G for Gatorade. We want to make 50% Gatorade. We want to make a liter of it, one liter. How do we solve for this X? This is simple algebra, right? So how do we solve for X? So 50 times one over 100, what do you get? What's that? 0 0.5. Okay, that means you'll need to have half a liter of regular Gatorade. And what are we going to have to add to it to make it up to a liter? Because we're making a liter, right? What do you think we add to it to dilute it down? Probably water, right? So we'd add another 0.5 uh, liters of water to that, and we'd end up with our dilution. So that's how this formula works, basically. So let's do an example with beta cyanin. How much stock solution, now you're welcome to pull out a calculator here. How much stock solution did you use of 80% beta cyanin when you make 20 milliliters of 20% beta cyanin? So remember the percent, that's concentration. That's C, C1, C2, that sort of thing. So what you do first is you assign the variables. That's the first step is which one C1, which one C2? What do I know and what don't I know? And then solve the question. So I'll let you look at that for a minute and then we'll reconvene in a second. So work it out. I see people staring, but feel free to actually solve it. Don't forget also while you're waiting, if you have not filled out the index card with your name to sit next to yourself, uh, I put one at each seat, so have a look at that. And so I can walk around and do attendance here in just a little bit. By the way, just for reference, this is table one and table two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so if I'm like, hey, table six, what'd you come up with? That's you guys back there. So setting up this, this question, what is C1? The concentration of the stock solution. 80. 80. And then uh, do we know uh, V1, the volume of stock solution? No, that's, a, that's what we're solving for. What is C2? C is concentration, right? So it's, it's both of them are 20 in this case, but 20% in this case, right? And volume is 20 milliliters. So to solve, remember we can, we can set this up for volume one. So uh, C2 times V2 over C1. What is the answer that you got? Thank you. Five milliliters. Okay. So that means we would need five milli milliliters of that stock solution. Now, how much water will we have to add to that to make our total dilution? We're going to need five of stock. How much is, the, what's the volume of the, of the solution we're making? 20. So you just find the difference between, uh, between uh, V1 and V2. Okay, so what's 20 minus 5? 15, you mean 15 milliliters of water then. All right, problem number two. Here's a molarity one. You use 90 molar ethanol to make 15 milliliters of 10 molar ethanol. How much did you use and how much distilled water did you need? Now, here's one thing I'm going to, this is harder with, with distancing and everything, but you can still talk to your lab partner. Um, 
If you have any trouble with this, of course we can ask, we can answer questions. You actually are the best, uh, have the, the, this Monday lab has the most help because you have a bunch of TAs back here too. So if you have any questions, you know, you can ask, but also the best way to learn, the best way to learn something is to teach it. So if you kind of got this and other person at your bench is struggling a little bit, you can um, work with them and tell them how you did it, teach them how, you don't just do it for them, but teach them how you did it, and then you'll learn it twice as well, and they'll learn it also. So um, I, wanna, I wanna encourage that kind of interaction as much as possible. Now what we might end up doing today is, uh, you two might end up working together because there's one of you at each bench or something. Uh, I think we still have someone missing today, but we'll figure that out when we do attendance. So if you have not yet done so, introduce yourself as you, as you wrap this up or as you get stuck. Introduce yourself to your lab partner and, uh, and then compare answers. I'm going to pause this recording so they don't have to wait. Hold on, I got to, there we go. All right, so let's look. Here's, so you said 1.66 repeating. Let's see what we got on here. 1.67 if we round, that sounds pretty good. Okay, and 13.33 milliliters of water. Okay, so how do we set that up? Once again, C2 times V2, we have to uh, assign our variable. So we are making 10 molar ethanol. Molarity is a, con is a concentration, okay? And volume, how much of it we're going to make, 15 mil. So you would take your 10 times 15 over 90. So C2 times V2 over C1, over concentration of the stock solution. And that gives you how much stock so solution you need. And then you have to figure out how much water you need to add to that to get to uh, the 15 mil that you're trying to make. And that's where that 13.33 comes in. If you're uh, not quite sure on that, we're going to have lots of practice today. And But I, I encourage you, don't let yourself not understand this if you're having a little trouble right now. I promise you it's not too intimidating. You just got to work on it a couple times. Um, and it'll be on pretty much every lab quiz from here on out until everyone gets it right. So um, these that we're doing today are pretty simple. Uh, what time is it? I think what I might, before we go today, I'm going to let you go ahead and do the, we're going to go through the lab, but, but at the end, if we have time, your exit ticket to get out of here today is going to be to work on the uh, the example questions, the example mass balance questions on page 18. Okay, so we're not going to jump into those right now, but those will be. I, I'm afraid of, of making you all do them now and then running out of time or something, but we'll we'll see if we have time at the end because I really want to make sure everyone understands that. Has it, anyone ever heard of entry tickets and exit tickets before for a class? Like you have to have done this to get in or you do this to leave kind of a thing? Yeah, okay. TAs might not have, I don't know. Okay, so we, we've done a few of those. I'm going to skip this one. I think you're on the right track and, and we'll have some real life examples here in just a second. Okay, so your manual already has a hypothesis for today uh, in it. Uh, I added a little bit to it to make it more the way that I want to see your hypotheses written. Although this one's pretty wordy today, yours won't always be that beefy. But um, on page 14, there's a hypothesis written. I just added an and statement to it, uh, and I'll explain this in a second. If you've already watched some of the lecture videos, you already kind of know what I'm talking about. I, I call this a research hypothesis. Well, I didn't invent it, but that's what it's called. And it includes a hypothesis, which is in blue up here, a hypothesis is a uh, explanation, a tentative explanation, meaning it might be wrong, but it's what you think is going on. An explanation, not a, not a prediction, but an explanation of how the variables are interrelated, how, how one affects the other. In red, or the, the sentence that starts with and, 
or the part of it that starts with and, that's basically your procedure, what you're going to do. And then the last part that starts with then is the prediction of what will happen. The prediction of what will happen if this explanation is correct and you do the stuff that's in red, okay? So this whole thing written out is if light absorption by a solute increases directly as the solute concentration increases. So if, if the more concentrated something is, the more light it absorbs, right? And the absorbance of several known concentrations of beta cyanin are recorded. That's what we're doing today. Then it will be possible to determine the concentration of an unknown beta cyanin solution by measuring the light absorbance of that solution once we've made our graph. Okay, so this is a real beefy one. I wouldn't expect, this is why I wrote this one today instead of making you do it, because it's day one, right? Um, but this is a, a beefy hypothesis, but it's, it's saying, okay, if light absorption works the way we think it does, and we test several samples, then we'll be able to predict the concentrations of unknown samples. That's basically what this hypothesis says. So we'll see if that's true. Over the next, we'll, we'll, we'll make a graph for today's lab and we'll do a few other things in the future. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we're going to fire up the equipment and we're going to uh, find the absorbance of the stock solution and do a number of things. So have a look at this slide first and then I'm going to move on to the next one. The stock solution has a concentration of, and you can write this down, 16 micromolar. 16, kind of a, a U looking thing and a, and a M, micromolar. So micro, micromolar here is the concentration, is, 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 it's 16 micromolar uh, solution. And in just a moment, we're gonna place three milliliters of that in a cuvette uh, but uh, but uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm going to have you turn your computers on and lots of other things before we can jump into that. Uh, and then we're going to calibrate our spectrophotometers and we're going to look at the wavelength most absorbed by the stock solution. Okay. Once we've done that, then we're going to work out our dilutions and we're going to make a bunch of dilutions of the stock solution and see how much light they absorb. And what we'll do is we're going to collect all that data as a class. So you're ultimately the assignment you're going to do uh, for this lab is going to be a, a graph, the standard curve, and it's going to be the whole class's data combined, not just your table's data. Okay. And I sent you an email with a link earlier today. Um, it's to a Google Sheet where we're going to record the data. Only one person per bench has to actually enter the table's data, but uh, someone will need to um, while we collect it today. All right, so let me just jump ahead on this so that way I, I don't have to be recording myself the entire time here. Um, here's an example of a dilution table. This is a mass balance table. It's mass balance equation put into a table, okay? And what we're going to do today then is we are going to find how much light is absorbed. And there, there's an example of this table already in your manual. Let me just point it out to you on page 16, except the one in the manual has one more column because it's also a data collection table where you'll record your data today. So um, the stock solution C1 is 16 for everything today. It's 16 uh, micromolar, okay? So, so it'll be 16 for all eight of our dilutions today. So you can go ahead and write that down for now. Um, the concentrations we're going to make today, I already determined them for you. We're going to make zero micromolar beta cyanin, one molar, two, or two micromolar, four, eight, 10, 13, and 16. That's what we're going to make today. And for every one of those, we're going to make five milliliters of it. Okay. And so in just a little bit, what we'll do is we'll figure out how much we're going to need. And let me show you a little trick that will help you in all your labs this semester. Once, let's say we already did all this math, okay? If you add up all of the V1s, you'll know how much stock solution you need to bring back to your table to do all the dilutions for the day, right? 
And if you add up all the volume of the distilled water column when you have that done, you'll know how much water you need at your bench to get through all the dilutions for the day. So that means you can just go to the back once and get how much you need, come back to your bench, and you don't have to go back and forth a bunch of times. So, so uh, the beta cyanin, like I said, is back here in these uh, containers. Distilled water is found in these carboys, in these jugs. There's one here and there's one there. That's distilled water. So that's what we make our dilutions with, okay? All right, now let me just jump ahead on our point for a second. Okay, we've already talked about what standard curves are. Um, Ultimately, what the outcome of all this lab today is we're going to make a standard curve, which is a graph, a scatter plot graph, basically. In Excel, that's how you graph it. And let's say, for example, that I had, uh, that we had made a graph of beta cyanine absorption, and these were all the samples we had done today. And then next week, I give you some random one, and it falls, you know, let's say absorbance is 60, so it falls like right here. Okay, that's within the range that we have already tested. You could figure out what the concentration of that solution was, and that would be known as interpolation because that sample fell within the range of the samples you would use to make the graph. But if I give you a really concentrated solution or a really dilute solution that fell out here or out here, that's called extrapolation. You can still predict what concentration it is, but you're going to be less sure of the validity of that prediction. It'll probably be a little less accurate, okay? So if I say interpolate or extrapolate, if you hear those phrases, it means were the unknown solutions within the range that you used to, to make the graph, or did they fall out of that range? And they're a little more, they're still predictions, but they may be a little less accurate. So you may see that terminology in your manual. I wanted to explain that to you. Um, I'm just jumping ahead here so I can stop recording. Otherwise, I would have waited to jump to some of these slides, but I just want to be done with the recording. Um, just so you know, the ultimate assignment for this lab is going to be to create a figure, um, and it's going to include a best fit line, and, and there's actually an assignment that's on the lab website that you can get from there, but I put it on my own personal blackboard as well, so you can get to it either way. And it'll say, put your graph here and answer these questions. So I tried to lay it out as clearly as possible. Um, and for my sections, uh, for, for lab group A anyway, it'll be due uh, in two weeks for you. Lab group B, it might, it'll be a little different. I'll let them know how that's going to work. But for lab group A, that's how it's going to work. Uh, and I'll talk to you more about that in just a little bit. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calibrate our spectro spectrophotometers. We're going to get logged into the computers, and we're going to collect our data, and, 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 and we'll make our dilutions and then collect our data.